With Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, they managed to play this sort of good cop, bad cop routine very well. Because Franklin Roosevelt could say to his conservative allies in Congress, and Franklin Roosevelt, he was a Democratic president, and he presided over Democratic, a Democratic House and a Democratic Senate, which meant that the chairman of all the influential committees in the House and Senate were Democrats, but this meant that these were the senior Democrats. And the seniors in the Democratic Party were Southerners from start to finish. And so every important committee in the Senate that was going to consider New Deal legislation on any matter related to civil rights or not related to civil rights was going to be controlled by a Southerner. And Franklin Roosevelt knew that if he made a strong plea, if he really pushed for civil rights legislation, then he would lose those Southerners who controlled the committees and none of his New Deal measures would get passed. And he made a calculated decision. He said, look, you know, I can do more for the people of this country if I lay off of civil rights and concentrate on economic rights. If I concentrate on the programs for the New Deal that benefit people all around the country, the time will come when civil rights legislation will be possible. But it's not possible yet. So he told Eleanor, just cool things off, and first things first, which was his approach to civil rights. And in fact, when Harry Truman is six, and now Truman is an interesting case, because Truman was a border stater, and Truman was from Missouri. Truman supported civil rights. But Truman also experienced how difficult it was to move the country on civil rights. Truman, interestingly, was the most Southern president since Woodrow Wilson. Missouri's not exactly South, but it had been a slave state, and so Truman knew about the legacy of slavery in Missouri. But Truman also was a, simply a liberal, and Truman believed that the country needed to move forward on civil rights. Ah, and there's another element that comes to play here, and again, it gets to this question of timing. Until 1945, Race relations in the United States were not an international concern. Nobody really cared much in India what the policy of the United States regarding race was. And more importantly, nobody in the United States cared what India thought about America's race relations. Because the United States simply was not thinking in international terms. But the Second World War awakened all sorts of people to the necessity for having world opinion on America's side. And Harry Truman looked out, and he realized that the world was changing, that India was becoming independent, that several countries, well, former colonies of Africa and Southeast Asia were becoming independent. They were joining the international community as full partners. And they were sending representatives to the United States. They were sending representatives to the capital of the United States. And as long as they were in D.C., which had abolished the Jim Crow system, they could stay in hotels. But if they wanted to cross the river into Virginia, um, the ambassador from India couldn't stay in a decent hotel in Virginia. This at a time when the United States was struggling to win the allegiance of these newly independent nations. And Truman recognized this as a serious problem. He also recognized that he didn't have the votes in Congress to change the position of the country on civil rights. So what did he do? He did what presidents can do on their own. He issued an executive order mandating the desegregation of the federal workforce and of the military. And the military was the real sticking point. The military. And the military, interestingly enough, is often this mirror on American society. And I don't know how close, I know some of you are close to academic history. Uh, Bleeves is certainly aware of this, that military history, for a variety of reasons, has fallen out of fashion in the academic world. And I think it's a shame. I think it's more than a shame. I think it's a scandal, in, in part because wars happen whether you like them or not, you have to deal with them, but also because 
military historians deal with many of the critical issues that societies confront. And we often see that the U.S. military is both a window on the larger society, but sometimes a leading indicator on where society is going. Harry Truman recognized that as president, he could order the military to desegregate. He couldn't tell, he couldn't order Mississippi to desegregate, but he could order the U.S. military to desegregate. Ah, but he discovered it's one thing to give an order and another thing to get the order carried out. Because the attitude of many elements of the federal bureaucracy is that presidents come and go, but the bureaucrats remain. And generals and admirals are soldiers and sailors, but they're also, at the higher levels, bureaucrats. And the attitude, well, actually, the Navy went along reasonably well and quickly with Truman's order. And the Air Force, that wasn't a particular problem either, but the Army dragged its boot heels. And two years later, when the Korean War broke out, the Truman gave his order in 18, 1948. Two years later, when the Korean War broke out, the U.S. Army was just as segregated as ever. And the argument was, if you've been paying attention, well, if you remember back to the 1990s, and the question of gays in the military, and you remember this compromise solution of don't ask, don't tell. And you will recall that much of the debate centered on the fighting cohesiveness of the units. Well, that was exactly, exactly the argument that was made in the late 1940s, early 1950s. You know, soldiers, when they go off to battle, they fight for their country. But at a more immediate level, they fight for their buddies. They fight for the other people in their unit. And if they don't like each other, then they're not going to fight very well. Well, this was the argument that the Army used to resist Truman's order. Oh, we'll study it. I mean, they never said no. You don't say no to the commander-in-chief. You just sort of salute, and then you go off and do whatever you're going to do. And so two years had passed, two and a half years had passed, and nothing had happened. But then, under the duress of war, when the U.S. Army was stretched to the breaking point, under the pressure of the war in Korea, and the demands of the Cold War in Europe, and various units in the Army found that they needed replacements wherever they could find warm bodies, and they just plugged them in. And under this pressure, they desegregated the Army. And to the, I will say, the honest surprise of many of the commanders, these integrated units fought just as well as the segregated units had before. And by 1952 or 1953, it was almost as though they'd forgotten there had ever been an issue. I'm just about running out of time, but I can't close without talking about Lyndon Johnson and the central issue of timing and the issue of, and this recurs again and again in presidential history, the role of luck. And you can call it good luck, you can call it bad luck, but twists of fate mean everything in determining who's going to be president and how the country is going to be governed. Lyndon Johnson dearly wanted to be president of the United States. Cleves and I were talking about this before we came downstairs this morning. They said, what it is emotion that motivates people? And why do people want to become president? And I've sometimes said, sort of half flippantly, that the decision to run for president, well, actually, this is apropos what we were talking about, that a number of presidents that we can identify and we didn't run through the whole list. But if you look at people like Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln was, in his day, he was described as melancholic. These days, we would, uh, he would be described clinically as deeply depressed. And you see this depressive streak in Theodore Roosevelt. You can see it in Franklin Roosevelt, although both Theodore Roosevelt and Franklin Roosevelt managed to sort of overcompensate. And I think this was one of the secrets of their success. Richard Nixon was described as being very depressed, certainly in the Watergate. And here you, you wonder if there's kind of constitutional depression or a situational depression. In, in his case, with you know, the, the world caving in, he probably had reason to be depressed. But anyway, 